everyone. It is Tuesday. Welcome to our Tuesday Transformation Healing Podcast. I'm your host, Ria Wang, a certified transformation healing coach. I help my clients to connect with their true unique power, transcend the limitation, and bring back the confident passion and the joy with clear vision of their own self. I have been traveling around the world to learning and sharing how healing is work, changing the world, changing our lives. In this podcast show, I'm so excited to invite my guests from all over the world come to here to share their inspiring stories, share the wisdom, the knowledge, share how they overcome with the challenge, changing their life. Today is my guest is Lawrence. I'm so excited. Lawrence, welcome to my podcast. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Yeah. So before we start uh, uh, Lawrence to share her, uh, his story, I will introduce a little bit about Lawrence. So Lawrence is premier focus on working with the entrepreneur, CEO, and the high individual people who understanding value of the mind. How is that work to release the full potential and the focus on clear, uh, clean that release anxiety, self sabotage, then limited beliefs. He's working help to create clear inner harmony, personal manifesting, and all of provide. So today, and also, Lawrence started practice his hypnosis since age 11, and he have to be work with 8,300 cases. Wow. Thank you. That is started at the age 11. Wow, Lawrence, tell a little bit of us before you start to tell, share your story. Tell where you come from first. <laughs> well, I'm originally from South Africa and uh, currently living in uh, beautiful British Columbia on the West Coast here in Canada. And uh, yeah, just absolutely loving it, living in a small little farming town called Summerland. That's wonderful. <laughs> That's warm. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me a little bit. How do you start at the age eleven for the hypnosis? That's really yeah. fascinating. Yeah, you know, um, growing up, I had a a series of less than positive experiences that um, basically. I, I learned to tune out and uh, dissociate pretty early on. I didn't quite know that it was the, what I was doing, but when I discovered some self-hypnosis tapes that my sister had very early on, I started experimenting and I found out I was really good at it. I was able to tune out pretty, pretty deeply <laughs> and... Um, be able to go inside myself and uh, escape, so to speak, uh, to to that world. Little did I know how therapeutic it was. <laughs> and um, I was able to navigate through some really sticky situations growing up. But as you can imagine, we don't really know too much about programming our own minds the way we want them to be that early on. So I was just basically uh, ragtagging it um got my first um graphic novel on sigmund freud and carl jung when i was 12 and that blew my mind quite a bit and understanding like whoa okay there's actually some like there's some reason behind all this craziness of the world and the way that we interpret it so um started pretty early with that uh did a lot of meditation in my karate class uh, until the church deemed it uh, the devil. And then uh, I secretly kept on meditating behind the scenes. And um, 
unfortunately, the things that happened to me when I was young had an effect on me that I just wanted to um, change how I felt about it. And I tried every freaking thing under the sun. Everything I tried, um, conventional to unconventional, you name it. And uh, as you can imagine, um, if you've got those kinds of experiences that you haven't learned how to process, they're gonna, they're gonna mess with you. And so I discovered booze pretty early on, discovered drugs pretty early on, and uh, lived that kind of a lifestyle that would kill most people before the age of 30. And um, mm. luckily it didn't, but I came very close one day in my late 20s uh, after living like the hedonistic party lifestyle for about 14 years, traveling the world, DJing, putting on festivals, things like that. And um, one day, body just said no i was uh in the middle of a week-long binge um of escapism um i'm not gonna say how much i was how much toxic substances i was doing at that time but let's just say it was it was enough to take any adult sized male out in a short period of time <laughs> and um body just said no woke up one morning i thought i was getting up to go and do my daily things. Instead, I floated up from my body and I looked down and there was my body and I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And um, looked up and I'm like, oh no, there's the tunnel of light. And uh, I thought I was gonna have some kind of a guardian angel stand at the tunnel going, no, not yet. <laughs> no, I didn't have any of that. Uh, that's when I realized how much of a selfish prick I was. Um, cause I, I didn't even get an escort into the light, uh, <laughs> not even, not even a taxi. Um, and so that's when I realized I was just living for myself and I was so self-absorbed in my own stuff that I was so unaware of so many things and, uh, made a promise to myself that should I get a chance to come back, I'm going to make something out of myself and I'm going to help this world and I'm going to make a difference. Next day was world hypnosis day and wow. uh, so went in. Yeah, go I ahead. want to ask you so how suddenly your body just gave up and when you say you sit in the bench so you just have the experience like life to your body then that moment give you the aha moment okay and you can you can say that was my aha moment um knowing that i was living a loop because that was basically, that was it. I was stuck in a loop for almost 25 years at that point in time. And I had to break that loop because it doesn't matter what I was doing in my life, the same things kept happening. The same patterns kept happening. And uh, one of the greatest ways to find out what's going on in your life is just look for patterns <laughs> because there's a reason that they're there. Um, I'll get into that in a moment, but basically, long story short, um, next day was World Hypnosis Day, <clears throat> went in for a demonstration, had my mind absolutely blown by how good I could feel in such a short period of time without having to take anything, without having to, you know, um, go out of my way to change how I felt. Um, this lady got me feeling like a million bucks in less than half an hour. And I was like, how the hell did you do that? And so the, the very next day I signed up to become a teacher trainer and uh, the rest is pretty much history. <laughs> um, in the process, I've discovered though that I work really well with entrepreneurs and change makers and risk takers because those are the kinds of people that really value and benefit from having a fully functional mind and having all their obstacles mentally and emotionally taken out of their bandwidth so that they can actually function at full capacity. So here I am, <laughs> eight years later. <laughs> eight years later, yes. Uh, tell, tell us a little bit of the journey. So we know when you know you're struggling when you was the younger time, then after your awakening, we say it's like you have that aha moment. From that aha moment to now, you say you've been doing like eight thousand cases with the so what is the one really tremendous that uh, healing, uh, even that transform make yourself 
amazed. I know as the healer or mm-hmm. as what we help the people, sometimes I get amazed with my work is because I didn't know that results come out. No, because when we go into work with our clients, we, we didn't plan that, oh, you must be doing this, this, this. Sometimes we lead with the higher energy, lead with that, then come out, we, we self with our clients both be amazed. Do you have that aha moment? So that uh, be amazed moment. I'm excited. I think my dear audience excited to hear that story. Yeah, absolutely. Um... I think the biggest thing that um, I've helped myself with with this processes and these techniques are basically, I would say the biggest element of it is being able to break free from the past and being able to reassign the resources emotionally that we attach to them so that no longer do these events and these experiences have this crippling effect on us Mm -hmm. but instead now we can laugh about it and that's how you know you've really healed something is if you can sit there and half an hour later laugh your ass off at the fact that it used to bother you pretty good chance it's no longer a problem (laughs) Yeah, so example, like example, I have uh, um, some friends, uh, our clients, um, not say clients, I also say friends, then um, he know everything about it because he's in this uh, trapped in this um, depressing cycle. Always everything happens to him around the where we have chaos. Then always have this, um, depressing every day feel he knows that depression may be not true um, he know he's trapped in this circle but he didn't know how to get out even we said okay let's meditate and let's do look this like do look he just doesn't have the driving to continue doing that so always doing anything maybe a couple days then give up so how you can help people like that can completely change in the this the like get out of that trap um can i share a graphic yes absolutely let me you need to make me host yes to do that i i've got exactly the thing for just that <laughs> okay so let's see here there we go okay can everybody see that i can't believe you can see that um so this is a little chart that i made Um, to describe the relationship between what we think and what we feel and what ends up happening outside of us in the world and what ends up happening inside of us internally. And so on the right-hand side, there's a spectrum of emotional states. And on the left-hand side of the pyramid, there's a, a varying degrees of mental expectation. And these two correlate with each other constantly all the time. And in other words, on the right hand side, all those different emotional states, bliss, unconditional love, passion, enthusiasm, determination, all the way down to grief, depression, despair, addiction, powerlessness. All of these are what I call default states. So in other words, if you wake up in that state in the morning, that's your default. And there's no good or bad. There just simply is what it is. In other words, that's the default because that's where a person has spent most of their time. Therefore, they've habituated their brain to produce the neurochemicals that they consider to be a normal state. I'm not going to go into brain chemistry right now, but basically, long story short, it's a way to just measure where we're at. So if we are waking up Bored, that's not the worst place to be. Boredom is that sweet spot between major transformation or major decline. (laughs) You can be really bored of just the same old, same old, and one day decide, you know what? I'm done. I need something else. I want to do something else. I want to feel something else. Or you can say that boredom is the start of the downward spiral uh, of self-destruction. And uh, being there, done that, got the t-shirt five times over. 
And basically, so the better we feel, what that correlates to is how frequently and how often we check in with ourselves and our own inner resources to problem solve, to get new perspectives, to find new meanings, reassign new meanings to things, you name it. We only do that by accessing our internal resources. And the only way to do that is to actually block the whole freaking world off, go inside, turn the world off, do the work that needs to be done, come back out, enjoy your day. That's how it should be, okay? The better we feel, the more often we check in with ourselves. And as you can see in the middle, there's a waveform that oscillates faster and faster the more you go to the top. And that just represents the frequency of checking in with oneself. And that's why they often say things such as, are you vibrating at a higher frequency, man? Well, what that really just means is how often are you checking in and problem solving, okay? Um, the better you feel, Obviously, on the left-hand side, you'll see the better your mental expectation becomes. Mental expectation is very important because that is what drives the suggestions we give ourselves, okay? If we are feeling fear, grief, depression, despair every day, all day, as you can see there, the frequency of checking in with yourself is very low, so chances are there's going to be a huge, bigger pileup of problems for the person. More things are not going to go their way. They're just going to go, what's wrong with me? Why does this keep happening to me? And all that kind of stuff. And so as you can see there, when you're feeling those low frequency emotions, your mental expectation is going to be pretty bad. And so you're basically see sowing seeds of destruction <laughs> all the time when we're in that place and so we're just going to keep attracting all the things that we don't want we're going to have all the experiences that we do not prefer and we're going to go what the hell it seems like i'm living in my own self-created hell and that's really what it is it's a way to understand that the crappier we feel each day the worse our mental expectation is going to become which in turn is going to create an abundance of scarcity in our lives. Now, it can it's not just money. It could be loved ones. It could be friends. It could be so many areas of fulfillment of our daily lives that we would just repel and we would push it away because we are not essentially embodying the end result of what we want to become. So in answer to your question, the first thing that a person would want to do is understand where they're at on this process and understand that the better they feel, the more synchronicity they're going to bring into their lives, the more magic is going to come back into their lives, the more spontaneous, wonderful things and surprises are going to come back into their lives. Mm -hmm. And overall, the quality of life is just going to drastically improve. But you have to be able to be honest with yourself as to how you're really feeling each day when you wake up. Because that'll tell you everything about where you're at. That requires a level of self-honesty that some people are really just not comfortable with. But once you are that honest with yourself as to where you're at, now you can navigate. If you look at the map and you're lying to yourself saying, I'm in the jungle, when in fact you're in the desert, it's a different escape plan to get out of the jungle than it is to get out of the desert. Okay? Okay. If you're really in the desert, you want to make sure there's plenty of water, okay? If you're in the jungle, you want to make sure you got some pretty damn good shoes on because <laughs> there's a million things that are going to butt you, okay? So being honest with yourself as to where you're at on the map so that you can more effectively navigate to where you truly want to be is my answer to that question. I'm going to stop the share here. Okay. <laughs> so that uh, is really cool map. Uh, and then uh, the question is, if someone doesn't have that map, then in the daily life, because a lot of people when they into the depression situation, you know, the mind can be like, a, when you think something stra stressful, then you got to keep going, 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 and keep go down that, that rabbit hole is getting so then they cannot be 
observe, jump out to observe what's going on than to change in that situation. If this is the case, what is the tips that can help them can quick stop on there than raising the frequency a little higher? Good question. Um, I would say the first thing is, if you're in a hole, stop digging. Okay, step one. <laughs> because most people, when they're on that downward spiral of negative emotion, um, usually they don't they they don't have the awareness, the self awareness, to become aware of just how far down that hole they've gotten. Mm -hmm. And so the first thing is to understand, number one, is if you're in that place, stop adding to it. That's the first step. Step number two is to realize that if you are experiencing anything like depression or anxiety, it's the result of fear-based thinking. Fear-based thinking is what fuels anxiety and depression. If you want to be happy, think happy thoughts. If you want to be depressed, think depressed thoughts. It's that simple. Obviously, to someone who's in the midst of depression, that sounds great, but it's like it's like telling someone to cheer up when they just lost everything, you know? It's like, it doesn't really help. So to understand what's happening inside of the nervous system and inside of the brain is way more important. Anxiety, generally speaking, is you using the magical power that you have to freak yourself out, okay? The subconscious doesn't know the difference between a real tiger trying to bite your head off and an imaginary tiger trying to bite your head off. Doesn't know the difference. So if we sit there and think about the worst outcome 24-7, we're going to freak ourselves out. The subconscious is going to go to work. It's going to prepare the body to go and fight and get ready, send all the energy to the muscles and the limbs and um, get the body ready to kick something's butt, okay? The problem with that is, is if you do that every day, every day, every day for a decade or two, your nerves are going to be absolutely shot. And depression is a natural byproduct of the nerves being completely burned out, at least the onset of it. The, the imbalanced neurochemistry side of it really has a lot to do with the thoughts that we hold within ourselves. And back to the idea of fear-based thinking. Fear-based thinking tends to produce cortisol in the body, which compounds. And the next thing you know, you've got a whole neurochemical cocktail of gunk that's blocking up the body and turning it into a very inhospitable place. And the next thing you know, you got inflammation. The next thing you know, you got pain. The next thing you know, you got um, gut issues. I mean, there's so many areas that this is going to manifest. And we all know that stress is the killer, is the biggest killer. However, there's different kinds of stress, <laughs> many different kinds, many different flavors of this ice cream. But to understand that the root of it is the result of fear-based thinking. And fear-based thinking always takes us down on that chart. It always causes us to feel worse and worse and worse because the subconscious doesn't know the difference between what's real and what we're thinking. So those That's I would say would be the biggest yeah. two things to do. That you make me think about once I was talking with a friend, then he was said, oh, I said, how do you release your stress? How do you, uh, when something come out, it's unexpected, uh, what you do with that? He said, I prepared. Every time like I have some project, I think my boss will be not happy with. So I already prepared my body. So when I go to there, even the worst situation, but my body already know, so I wouldn't get that much stress. Yeah. Is that kind of like a, um, I'm not sure. So you haven't no things happen yet, but your body is already in that freaking stress yeah. situation. It's is like that going really that. help? But he believed that helped him. That's how he deal with his stress. Yeah, that, that is one way. It's a valid option. 
I'm never going to say that any option is invalid. Um, however, in terms of, you know, return on investment emotionally, <laughs> I would suggest for him that instead of going to a fight by punching himself in the face so that he doesn't get surprised when he gets punched, that's not exactly the most efficient use of energy. What I would rather say is to understand that there's a reason why that person needs to prepare themselves for specific outcomes because they unconsciously expect that outcome. Mm. And so by understanding that if they change that expectation and turn it into something more meaningful and effective, not only are they gonna save themselves a lot of energy, but they're just gonna feel a lot better too during these processes. Um, because obviously everything in the subconscious comes from some kind of a cause. If we don't like the effect of something, we need to look at the cause. And believe it or not, 95% of the people I work with, the causes come from the first eight years of life. So somewhere something happened that made it so that that's his survival mechanism for that type of process. I'm not him, so I can't guess here what it is, but chances are it's something from very early on that got imprinted to say that if I do this, then some negative thing will happen. So I better prepare ahead of time for that negative thing to happen. Guess what? You're going to create that negative thing to happen. It's, it's like think, saying, don't think of a black cat. It's, it's, you're still going to do it. <laughs> so <laughs> That's a black uh, cat coming all the time. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> by just understanding that um, once a person learns how to shift and control their state, that immediately colors the types of thoughts that they will have. If you're in a good state, by default, your thoughts are generally not going to be very fear-based. However, when you're emotionally fearful unconsciously about something, it's going to color everything you think, everything you say, everything you do. So there always is the two parts. It's how we feel as our default and how we've trained our mind to focus on either problems or opportunities. You can say that the mental expectation is controlled by the reticular activating system in the brain, whose job it is to spot patterns and find problems or solutions or opportunities. It depends completely how we tune it through what we focus our attention on. But I'm going to go so far as to say, you can sit there and have the greatest attitude about life and everything and, um, you know, have the you know, attempt to think the most high quality thoughts. If you're waking up feeling like crap, it's not going to last very long. That, that, mm. that low frequency emotion is going to creep in and start coloring things. It just is a matter of time. Mm. So like an example, when you think about your says, don't think about that. Don't put your body in that mood, the, the fight, fly, the mood, but the, what if that person in front of you, then he said, yes, you tell me I'm not thinking what the, because that was saving me before. Like we said, maybe from childhood, maybe, but he been used that for his whole life. Now you ask he switch that to think something positive. He said, then if something really happened, my boss was yelling at me, then I didn't prepare my body freaking out, then what I do? So okay. how again, you can again, start with yeah. that? Again, it's the difference between a Band-Aid solution, which is what that is, okay? Mm -hmm. And then there's the difference between that and finding out what the root cause is so that even if the boss yells, he can just stand there and hold his own and not be affected by it whatsoever. So mm -hmm. it's the fear of a certain outcome that's preparing his body that certain way. Mm -hmm. The best advice I would give to someone like that is pull yourself out of your own story. Get out of your own story. And everybody has a story they tell themselves. 
And one of the most helpful things in life that I've discovered is when you are able to dissociate yourself from your own story and just see it for what it is, a story involving a person and this person is the way they are because of X, Y, and Z life experiences. And when you can look at it from the outside, you are now in the director's seat. When you're in the middle of the, the story and you know the bullets are flying and the bombs are going off and people are blowing up next to you and things like that, um, yeah, it, 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 see, it can be pretty scary. It can be pretty fear-inducing. It can be pretty horrible sometimes. A lot of people have had some really terrible experiences in life. And my mission is to eliminate as much unnecessary suffering as humanly possible before I leave this world because suffering is optional. Growth and wisdom should be mandatory. And if we are able to extract the wisdom out of less than positive experiences, relationships, encounters, you name it, if we are able to extract the wisdom behind it, we call that growth. Wow, I, I learned something. I think that's a powerful words. Can you say again, Lawrence? I love that. So please repeat that again. You say suffering is the temporary, then wisdom uh, and uh, what else? Growth. Wisdom and growth. Yeah, that should be what we should all aim for. Even if it was a really horrible, horrible, horrible experience. There's always something to be learned from it. Um, you have many, many stories of these Holocaust survivors who went through absolute hell. Many people in our shoes would have taken our lives by the degree of suffering these people went through, just as an example. But how come so many of them could come out the other side absolutely unscathed? Yeah, sure, their bodies were a little bit withered, but their minds were, be, were able to stay 100% bulletproof during those times. And I've always been fascinated by people like that. It's like, what the hell did they do that made it so that they actually came out better than they came in? Mm -hmm. And that to me is the mission that I wanna share the most is once people understand just how powerful their minds are, to create the changes that they want to create. You don't feel that alone in this world anymore. You feel like you're connected to something bigger. You feel like there's something, dare I say, special about you being here, you know? And um, I don't know about you, but I missed the class growing up about how the human mind works in school. Um, I had to, you know, skip class <laughs> and go to the library to study Jung and uh, uh, Freud when I was in, in primary school. And um, as you can imagine, I got into a lot of crap for that. But long story short is we have not been given a proper education about mm. this supercomputer that we have between our ears. And I think that a lot of people will look at life very differently if they knew the amount of power that they had right under the nose. That's, I'll be a lot more happy too. <laughs> <laughs> that is very uh, wisdom suggestions then you talk about it in here. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, uh, also here is have a lot of help to uh, help you not stuck inside your own stories you can find the many ways we know in the world and now people start to have more than more people have the open mind accept the something they're not learning in the school when they grew up so such as hypnosis meditation all different different the tool you can use just like how so how people can find you Lawrence then if they need help that I hi Lawrence I need help I'm stuck in my in my uh, own stories with my limited belief I want to recreate that I wanted to rewire my my brain have more successful feel that joy than in my life so where they can find you 
Okay, well, uh, I will post the link. Um, I'll be giving away to your audience 25 copies of my seven day mental makeover challenge that I've created. It's essentially um, a really good primer and test drive for these kinds of processes and techniques. Um, essentially what that covers is how to free yourself from less than positive experiences, how to break free from overwhelming negative emotion, um, how to deal with anxiety, anger, uh, how to actually relax, how to actually change your state. There's a whole variety of little tricks and um, tools in there. And so that would be a good test drive for people to give this a whirl for themselves. Um, if people want to reach out to me, I'm on LinkedIn. I'll provide you with the links for everything as well as they can sign up for my upcoming goal-based meditation program that I'm starting, which is going to be a free meditation every week uh, for them to get a better idea of how they can start blending self-hypnosis with their current meditation practice, because I find a lot of people that I work with, they think they're meditating, but most of the time they're just sitting there being frustrated going, when can I stop? Um, <laughs> and most of them never get to the depth that they're looking to get to. Mm. For me, speed and depth is everything. And uh, why waste an hour wondering if you're meditating, if you can just spend two, three minutes actually in there, get the job done and go about your day. So Definitely, I'll be posting the links. I'll share the links with you. People can check them out. I'll give you a promo code. The promo code, I'll just make it RIA. Um, one word, R-I-Y-A. And people can use that to get the first 25 folks that jump on there can get it for free. It's valued at 200 bucks. Uh, it's, a, it's a good primer and a good test drive. So, yeah. Wow. Thank you so much, Lawrence. Thank you for your generosity. And uh, I think I'm so excited. I can't wait to see that all the tools so you can use practice then with Lawrence. Thank you so much, Lawrence, come here to share your knowledge with all of us. Thank you, everybody. So this is our Tuesday Transformation Podcast. If you have your stories, then you have your wisdom that you like to share with the world. You can reach out to me at Zenquency Art of Healing, or you can reach out to me, just post the DM me on this chat, uh, on this show. So I'm looking forward to next Tuesday. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Lawrence. You're welcome. Thank you very much for having me.